Top 10 Unpopular Ancient Warriors Part 2 In the height of the Mongolian Empire, while Kublai Khan was ruling, some of Mongolians did not like the ways and politics of Kublai Khan, including Kaidu Khan, his cousin. Eventually, it led to a civil war between Kaidu and Kublai. In those wars, Kaidu trusted and relied for military expertise on only one person. It was Kutulu, his daughter. She was the great-granddaughter of Genghis Khan. Being born in 1260 Common Era among 14 brothers, she was skilled in horse riding, sword fighting, archery and wrestling. Mongolians used to fight all the time, wrestle with anyone. Since Kaidu wanted his daughter to be strong, she wrestled with other men and won every time. As Marco Polo has written about her, she was able to beat down male wrestlers before she was even a teenager. She assisted her father in the battles against Yuan dynasty of Kublai Khan, her cousin. Marco Polo writes how she would come in like a hawk into her enemies and grab them. She was also known for her brutal ways of killing enemies. When Kaidu wanted to get her married, she rejected every proposal. Then she put up an offer. Anyone who wishes to marry her should defeat her in a wrestling duel. If the competitor won, she would marry him. If lost, he had to give her 100 horses. Finally, she had 10,000 horses and no husband, though it's said that she finally decided to marry. Because of the rumors of that, she's having an affair with her own father and that's why she doesn't marry anyone. Though it's said that she married, it's not clear to whom. In 1301 Common Era, Kaidu Khan died after a battle. In deathbed, he wanted Kutulun to succeed him as the Khan of the Empire. Yet, many people including her brothers did not want her to be the Khan. So, it passed down to Temur Khan. Kutulun died in 1306 at the age of 46. Born in 375 as the daughter of Neoptolemus, king of Epirus, Olympias was originally named as Mertel. She was wife to Philip II of Macedonia and the mother to the renowned emperor Alexander the Great. It is believed she was named as Olympias after Philip II won the Olympic Games in 356 before Common Era. Philip's polygamy didn't threaten her position until he married the highborn Macedonia, Cleopatra. After that, she withdrew to Epirus with the crown prince Alexander. In 336, Philip II was assassinated at his daughter's wedding feast. Even though the assassin had personal motives to murder the king, some suspected that Olympias and Alexander are responsible for the assassination. After the death of Philip, Olympias returned to Macedonia. Soon after, she killed Cleopatra and her infant daughter Antipater, a Macedonian general, ensured Alexander's succession as the king of Macedonia. When Alexander went on to war in Asia, Antipater remained as the regent of the empire. Olympias often quarreled with the regent over ruling, then retired to Epirus. After the death of Alexander the Great, Macedonia and Greece were left to Antipater. Then again in 319, after the death of Antipater, his successor invited Olympias to act as regent to her grandson Alexander IV, the son of Alexander the Great. Then, in 317, Cassander, Antipater's son, established Philip Aridius as the king of Macedonia, a simple-minded son of Philip II. Olympias returned to Macedonia and killed Philip Aridius and partisans of Cassander. When Cassander learned this, he surrounded Macedonia. In 316, Olympias surrendered to him. She was condemned to death by the Macedonian assembly, but Cassander's soldiers refused to carry out the sentence. She eventually was killed by relatives of those she had executed. Cassander captured Alexander IV and his mother, the widow of Alexander the Great, Roxana as well, later executed both. Although Alexander the Great gets a lot of credit for being one of the toughest people in the ancient world, his mother Olympias was no joke when it came to dispatching of her enemies. As a tribal princess in what's now Greece and Albania, Olympias claimed that her family had a noble heritage. According to legend, they descended from Achilles. Illyria was a region on the western half of Europe's Balkan Peninsula. This area roughly corresponds to parts of modern-day Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Slovenia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Serbia and Albania. Among those tribes, there was one tribe close to prominence in 3rd century before the Common Era. It was Ardiai. The Ardiaean kingdom underwent aggressive expansion from 250 to 231 before Common Era under the leadership of King Agron.
Apparently, King Aegon held a feast to celebrate his expansion and drank until his lungs collapsed and died. After his death, his wife, Queen Regent Teuta, ruled instead Aegon's infant son, Ines. Teuta continued her husband's expansionist policies, turning her sights to the wealthy cities of Dyrrhachium and Phoenix, eventually conquering both. However, perhaps more so even than her powerful navy, Teuta's most feared forces were the Illyrian pirates that roamed the nearby seas. Piracy in Illyria was legal and even considered a respectable profession. Teuta gave her ships free reign in the Mediterranean Sea, and Illyrian pirates were well known and feared for their plundering of merchant ships. Unfortunately, her pirates attacked the new rising power across the Adriatic Sea, the Roman Republic. Roman merchant ships often were attacked and plundered by Illyrian pirates. Once the Roman Senate couldn't ignore the complaint, around 230 before Common Era, they sent ambassadors in hope of a diplomatic solution. But Teuta wasn't ready to bow down to the new regional power. And as it was legal, she wasn't going to change the rules of the kingdom for Roman merchants. Teuta was apparently so insulted by the Roman envoys that she had their ships seized. What's more, she held one ambassador captive and killed the other one. When news of their ambassador's death reached the Roman Senate, Rome did what it does best, go to war. Romans sent 200 ships across the sea with 20,000 troops. Though Teuta prepared for the war, her first loss came even before the battles began. Because when the Romans arrived at the city island of Osaira off the Illyrian coast, the local governor and Teuta's lieutenant Demetrius switched sides, advising the enemy for the rest of the conflict. The Illyrian forces were no match for Rome's military power, and Teuta was forced to retreat south. By 228 before Common Era, Roman had gained control of the entire coast of Illyria. Teuta officially surrendered to Rome in 227, ending the First Illyrian War. After the defeat, she was offered to rule Illyria with limited powers. She refused and stepped down from the crown. Although not clear, it said she lived few years more and jumped off a cliff in the Bay of Koto in modern-day Rison, Montenegro. After uniting Mesopotamia, Persian conqueror Cyrus the Great headed his huge army and ventured to the east. At that time, the Masajatai were ruled by the Queen Comiris. She was the daughter of Spargapisus, the leader of all Masajatai tribes. Cyrus II sent an envoy to Queen Tomiris after the death of her husband, offering to marry her. Realizing that it was only a conniving plan to occupy her kingdom, she refused. Persians took a military approach and marched on to Masajatai lands aggressively. Masajatai, although known for their horseback and infantry skills, did not get into big clashes with the Persians. Here, Cyrus again decided to use a trick. He ordered to set a camp and to poison all the wounded and sick soldiers, ambushing with his good troops near the river. The Masajatai, led by the son of Tomiris, Spargapisus, attacked the camp at night, but found no resistance and decided that the Persians fled. Celebrating the victory, they drank the poisoned wine left by the Persians. When most of the Masajatai squad fell asleep, the Persians attacked and massacred almost the entire detachment. Son of Tomiris was captured. Tomiris requested the release of her son, given that he wasn't captured in battle, but by tricking him and saying if refused, she would avenge him and would give Cyrus his share of blood. Then, not wanting to be a spawn of Cyrus, Spargapisus committed suicide. As soon as Tomiris learnt of her son's death, she decided to attack the Persians. In the Great Steppes, there was a battle in which Masajatai unleashed all its might and fury on the Persian army. Persian Emperor Cyrus the Great was killed in this combat. Tomiris ordered to fill her skin full of human blood. She dipped the head of Cyrus in the go, saying, Thus I make good my threat and give you your fill of blood. Tomiris' victory over Cyrus became a legend. For a long time, the Saka and Masajatai had secured their borders against the Persians. The Queen Tomiris became a symbol of freedom and strength of the Sakha and the Masajatai army. Vercingetorix was a Gaelic chieftain who rallied the tribes of Gaul, modern-day France, to repel the Roman invasion of Julius Caesar in 52 before Common Era. The name Vercingetorix means victor of a hundred battles and was not his birth name but a title and the only name he is known by. When Germanic tribes attacked Gaul, Caesar employed Gauls as mercenaries. Vercingetorix was among these Gauls Caesar employed and led cavalry units for the Romans against the Germans in these battles. 
Later, Caesar began instituting Roman law and culture in Gaul. Gallic tribes were not fond of it and protested. A Gallic leader named Ambiorix of the Eburons tribe pressed these people to revolt, claiming their right to freedom in their own country. In response, Caesar attacked and massacred Eburons. Vercingetorix was the chieftain of his tribe, the Averni, by then. He attacked Cenobum in 52 before Common Nera and massacred the Roman settlement there to avenge the massacre of Eberons. After his victory, he called upon every tribe to join him in the conquest, and almost every tribe answered. Romans had never dealt with the guerrilla war like the kind Vercingetorix now waged, making swift strikes on the Romans and their supply lines, then disappearing into the surrounding landscape. There could be no victory for the Romans because there was no enemy for them to engage. The Gauls struck and vanished like the spirits, and besides this, it was now winter in Gaul, and Labianus, Caesar's second in command, already had little enough food, even before his supplies had been cut. At the time, Julius Caesar was out of the country. Hearing about the attacks, he came back with a massive Roman troop at his back. Hearing of Caesar's march on Gaul, Vercingetorix expanded the scope of his scorched earth policy. Anything and everything which could help the Romans in any way was destroyed. Upon returning, Caesar conquered and massacred massacred Avericum city with its 40,000 population. After the massacre, all of Gaul wanted revenge, and Vercingetorix's army doubled overnight. He continued his guerrilla warfare. The chief advantage Vercingetorix had over Caesar in every encounter was his cavalry, which could outfight, outrun, and outmaneuver the Roman forces. Caesar recognized the problem, and he brought in his former enemy, Germanic tribes who known for their horsemanship skills as mercenaries. Vercingetorix was surprised on his surprise attacks himself and was forced to retreat in the city Alesia by German cavalry. Caesar surrounded the city and laid siege. Meanwhile, Vercingetorix's brother came in with reinforcements for the rescue. Gauls attacked Romans at the same position from the both sides and were winning, until Caesar decided to lead the battle himself, wearing his famous red cape so the Romans could recognize him and the tides turned. Vercingetorix was forced to surrender and sent to Rome and executed six years later. Though defeated, Vercingetorix's fame grew and he became a popular cult figure and legend shortly after his death. The Gauls never forgot the time when they had united as a nation. Today, he is widely recognized as the first national hero of France. Like the video, drop your ideas in the comment section and share the video and subscribe the channel for more videos.